afternoon, Judge Francis de la Guardia. On behalf of the Hispanic National Bar Association, we want to thank you in accepting this recognition as a jurist of excellence. Um, we celebrate 50 years in the Hispanic Bar National and the HMBA, and we're very proud to have chosen you to uh, honor and recognize today. So having said that, Judge, we're going to start with a few questions. Um, First, background. Um, what is it about your upbringing? And tell us a little bit about your your challenges and your background. Sort of like a give us a, a a short summary of what it was like growing up Hispanic and where you come from. So, um, thank you, Francis, and and I thank the Hispanic National Bar Association for this honor. Uh, my parents left Cuba in 1960. Uh, I was born uh, several years later, I won't reveal the year, uh, but I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, where they had settled for employment reasons. My upbringing, uh, like most uh, first generation uh, children, was modest. Uh, we moved from Baltimore, we moved to Puerto Rico, where I lived for several years, went to school there, and finally we made our way to Miami uh, when I was eight years old. All of this was due to my father's work uh, and, uh, and his company moving him. So we certainly faced challenges as I was growing up uh, from the financial to the cultural to language-based. When I started kindergarten in Baltimore, I didn't speak any English because we only spoke Spanish at home. Uh, it, was a, it was a shock um, and the teachers didn't know what to do with me. Uh, I gained a healthy respect for a strong work ethic and for sacrifice. When my father left the insurance industry uh, years later and began practicing law as a solo practitioner, I was a young teenager uh, at that time, and my mother returned to a teaching job. Uh, I remember those years, they, making ends meet uh, was difficult. Uh, vacations were few and far between. Uh, my sisters and I uh, all started working part-time jobs in high school. I was 15 when I started working weekends while I was going to school. Uh, we learned how to live and enjoy life without the trappings of wealth. Uh, my mom was really good. She was adept at making us feel secure, at uh, making us feel like we could attend any function in any event uh, and find something suitable to wear in a store that no longer exists. I don't know if uh, those listening or watching remember the store, the store that was called Zare, and we would go to Zare or Kmart and find something that we could wear. Um, from this upbringing, Francis, I acquired a strong desire, a very strong desire to excel academically. Uh, I knew education uh, was the only road I could take uh, to better uh, myself and our situation. Uh, to become a professional like my father, like my mother, who was at that point, uh, she went on from teaching grade school to teaching at the university level, and to be financially uh, capable of, of sustaining myself and, uh, and the lifestyle that I wanted. So that, that's, that's sort of a synopsis. That's, that's an amazing background. And yes, I remember Zaire, but exactly, in my house, it was Zaire. It's Zaire, I'm almost Zaire. I'm on Zaire. <laughs> And I do remember that. And um, growing up in Hialeah, I, I understand a lot of your background sort of resounds with me because it sounds very similar to what, and I'm sure many Hispanics uh, that came here, you know, born here first generation or soon thereafter. Um, right. I wanted to ask you a question about cultural diversity and um, being the first Cuban American federal judge to be appointed, and then the first female judge in the in the dis I think in the federal district's history, if I'm correct, I think it's a hundred and some seventy five years or something. Someone said. Oh, in, in our in our district, no, we had no, we had other women district court judges before. But the first, first female district. Hispanic, right? Yes. Yes. That that's what I thought. So I I mean, you've made incredible gains and and strides, and we certainly you know uh, walk in your footsteps and hope to achieve everything you've achieved, but. Have you think? Do you think things have gotten better? Um, diversity on the bench, uh, proportionally to minority groups, since your beginning in, in on the bench and now. What? Do, how do you feel about that? Well, first of all, let, let me just make a correction. I do think that Judge Lenore Nesbitt uh, uh, may be considered uh, Hispanic. I believe she had a Spanish uh, grandfather 
if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow, yes, yeah. Judge Nesbitt yeah. was amazing. I didn't know that, right. that's wonderful. Right. Lenore Carrero Nesbitt. Um, it, it is very important to have cultural diversity on the bench. Judges are the face of our country's justice system. Litigants and the public need to have confidence in our court's ability to decide ca cases fairly. So having litigants see and know that our judges are representative of the community, that are products of the communities that they serve, all of this engenders greater trust in our courts. Um, I do think we've gotten better at having uh, diversity on the bench, uh, uh, diversity that's proportional to the minority groups in our communities. In the federal judicial nominating process, uh, I think our, our nation's presidents and senators are keenly aware of the need for a representative judiciary. They are interested in promoting to the bench highly qualified candidates. Um, in our state's judicial process, uh, uh, similarly, I think our governors um, and the voting public are mindful of the need to have a representative judiciary. Diverse candidates are selected and they go on to serve. So um, certainly uh, cultur culturally diverse candidates uh, face certain challenges in seeking appointment or election to the bench. Um, but it may be that in the electoral process for the selection of state judges, I think the challenges may be greater uh, than for those who seek appointment to the federal judiciary. Um, not yeah, all voters. Yeah. I, I would agree with you on that. I, I think that that could be a whole topic in itself, you know, electing right. versus appointed. Yes, I agree. I mean, not, not all voters are aware of the diversity that a candidate brings to the bench. Uh, if the voter is uninformed and is voting based on a candidate's name alone, there's other diversity besides ethnic and racial diversity and um, and uh, so I think there is a, still a challenge in the electoral process in educating voters about what unique uh, attributes each candidate has and brings uh, to the bench. I agree, Judge. That is certainly true. I, I think moving on to the next topic, changes over time. I, I think you probably have this question asked all the time. What motivated you to become a judge? And um, I think when judges speak to this, it really speaks to not just, you know, to all the public and, and sometimes you motivate someone because I think like it's the highest office, at least personally for me that I, as, as an attorney that I would want to achieve. So if you could share a little bit of what motivated you and, and any challenges that you had as when you first start out as, you know, a Hispanic judge, because, you know, time things have changed and they've gotten better, but I'm sure without revealing my age either, um, things are a little bit different than when I started practicing law back in the 80s. How about that? I said the 80s. <laughs> the 80s. Okay, I'll, I'll echo that, Francis. You and I both started in the 80s. Um, I think for a lot of us judges, serving as a judicial law clerk, I think is what puts that initial thought in the back of one's mind. Sometimes it's forefront in the mind for some young lawyers. In my case, it, it was buried in the back of my mind, but it's certainly what sparked my interest in becoming a judge one day. I wouldn't recognize it until many years later. But um, in addition to that year's mentorship uh, with the judge, uh, my years of practice, including interac interactions with judges and lawyers also served uh, as motivators to become a judge. One only has to be either treated poorly or treated very, very well uh, to feel some type of motivation to be that judge that every lawyer and litigant aspires uh, to practice before. I was a Hispanic county court judge back when there weren't that many. Uh, that was some 27 years ago. Uh, the novelty of being a Hispanic judge in Miami-Dade County, I think no longer exists. And, and that's a good thing. It is. Um, and so I certainly, have witnessed and experienced discrimination against minorities. I, I'm not gonna dwell on, on that. Uh, what does one learn from those experiences? Well, I, I think those experiences further solidify the commitment to treat everyone fairly and with respect. Um, so in, in my years of practice, I always strive to learn the lawyer's name and use it in the courtroom, uh, to call the person by name and to treat everyone with respect and listen to their arguments and their positions. And when you rule, you rule. 
I, you know, you have to call the balls and strikes and rule and somebody might win and somebody might lose, but in the process you've been listened to, you've been treated fairly and respectfully. I, I agree again, Judge. Um, I, I clerked for Judge Melvia Green on the third DCA, and I remember that that was an experience to me that sort of lit that spark also that, wow, you know, seeing a female, a strong female judge, and, you know, she taught me so much, and she treated all of the, everyone who appeared before her with such respect that it, it I already honored the profession, but it just raised it up. So I do think it's important when you see people that are similar to you on the bench, whether it's a female or your same minority group, it, it's a wonderful and um, inspiring. Um, which brings us to the next question. Um, you know, aside from good education and work ethic, which you obviously have, you went to Yale, so, and you are an FIU alumni too, so yay. Um, yay. What are the essential qualities that you believe are important for judges to have? Um, besides those two that you mentioned, I think it's critical for the judge to be a good listener. Um, listen to each side. Don't be so, um, if you have questions, ask them, but give the parties an opportunity to explain their positions. Be good listeners, have the ability to work through difficult issues and come to an analytically strong and well-explained result. So the parties know why you reached that result um, and, uh, and either do it in your oral pronouncement or do it in a carefully worded uh, opinion. Um, the desire to do justice every day, wake up, waking up every day energized um, and excited by the prospect of, of going and doing justice in, in your work, uh, again, uh, a commitment to treating all litigants uh, with respect and, and giving the parties timely decisions. Uh, justice delayed is indeed justice denied. Most folks don't wanna be in court by, in either a civil case or a criminal case. So doing all of this and doing it in a timely way, I think that sort of sums up uh, what I think are the most important attributes. One of the things you said, Judge, about listening, how hard was it to, be, because I think as lawyers, speaking on the advocate side, it's really hard to listen sometimes because we're so prepared to, to argue our case, right? And sort right. of when you become a judge, you have to take off that advocate hat and sort of just be, not sort of, you have to be impartial and you have to listen to both sides. How hard was that um, in doing that, coming from being an attorney, because you did, you know, you worked for the county and you worked in, in you know, law firms and and so on. So how hard was it for you, if at all? It wasn't. I mean, it gives, I think it gives me a chance to digest even more what, what each side has to say and, and to ask those questions when needed. Don't just ask a question for the sake of hearing your voice. Um, I'm, that, that sometimes comes up when I participate in some moot court arguments for law schools. And certainly the role of the judge is to ask uh, the, the law students questions and pepper them with questions to see how they react and how they respond and pivot. But, but you have to pace yourself, right? You need to give the advocate a chance to be heard, a chance to explain uh, a position. Um, listening is key. I think listening is key for almost any uh, yeah. walk of life, right? And I think probably that we should do more of that. Um, I certainly am guilty of, I, I start, I, I should listen better and more. Um, so to wrap it up, we're going to ask you a fun question. So I looked at these fun questions and I was like, wow, which one? I'm going to let you answer the one that you want to answer. <laughs> so I, I, I had fun as well um, with the fun questions. That, Did that you? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, I so would you want, what actor would, if you, it was a movie made of, of, of you, Judge, who would portray you? You know what? The first person that came to mind just popped into my head was Sarah Jessica Parker. That's the one oh, I thought. Oh, yes, I can see it, yes. <laughs> I just thought, there, there you go. That's somebody who might uh, might portray me. Um, certainly, if I had a time machine and could have dinner with somebody famous, it would be Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, um, wow, yes. yes. We all want to sit down and have a meal with her and chat with her. I had the opportunity of meeting with her and spending time in her chambers at the Supreme Court many years ago. Um, but to have dinner with her and break bread and, and just that's hear amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. What a wonderful experience. I think that's a great choice. Um, and I guess the one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you. 
Um, I started, that was a tough one. And I thought maybe people would be surprised to learn that I'm a vegetarian. I love animals and uh, I love a good hiking adventure uh, with my daughters and hopefully one day with my grandchildren. So those that's are some, wonderful. I don't know if people that's knew. Good. Things I about. wish I could become a vegetarian. I really wish I, I try. I fail miserably every time I try. So I'm more of a pescatarian. So I'm, I'm halfway there, sort of. Yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> but, um, Thank you so much, Judge.